Hey there, welcome to Farmcraft. I've put together a list of some of my favorite farm and garden tips, hacks, whatever you want to call them. This is not a list of nonsensical things just to make a video and throw it on YouTube. These are real practical things that I actually use quite regularly. A lot of these I've developed myself, so I think there's a really good chance that several of these, at least one, you will have never seen before. Uh, if you've seen all of them, well, well, I'll eat this screwdriver. Let's get to it. Here's some farm and garden tips. Ugh. For any equipment that sits, get one of these battery tender. Uh, I find that these work way better than the cheapo ones on eBay. And, um, you know, this is a fully waterproof one. This entire thing is encased in epoxy. You can't even really open it up. And, you know, there's my battery. It's constantly being charged and kept at full. Now, this is my boat, you know, so that's nice. The battery's not going to freeze in the winter, but here's the plug-in for the one that I have mounted up under there, right there on my tractor. And it's hooked to the battery and keeps the battery topped off. Now, that charger costs maybe 30 or 40 bucks. It's going to pay for itself. Not only do I have a much easier time starting the tractor, especially in the winter, in the winter, the batteries are weaker because of the cold temperature, and it's harder to start because of the cold temperature. So having it plugged in so when I come up to it, the battery is topped off makes it much easier to start. And the reality is your, your battery is going to last longer just because it's being managed like this by the battery tender. But also, even once the battery gets to the point where it would be struggling to start it, you would end up replacing the battery sooner because you don't have the charger. With the charger on there, you're going to be able to continue to use the battery in, in the last months of its life longer than you would otherwise. So this is really convenient. Any piece of equipment that has a roll bar like this, you can put shade on very easily. Just go get some light pine, you know, like one by three. This is scrap wood I had laying around, but I actually wish it was a little bit lighter. And then staple a tarp to it. A couple C-clamps, you can put it on, take it off in a matter of a minute or two. And, um, you know, if you look at pricing shade, like they make metal shade structures that are permanent that you could put over, uh, they're extremely expensive and very small. And if the sun's coming at an angle, it's not going to shade you at all. This, I can, I can put it where I want it. If I'm doing a lot of digging on the backhoe, loosen the clamps, I move it back and then I'm more in the shade back here. Uh, if I'm sitting in the seat mowing a field, then I put it forward. Uh, if I don't want it on, I just take it off. And the real beauty of it is when you run it into something, and I say when, not if, because uh, <laughs> in my experience, you will run it into something uh, and it breaks. You just laugh, you know, like, OK, replace the board or even just patch on a little patch. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't it's not a big, expensive thing. You didn't pay a lot of money for it. Uh, it works better than the, the stuff you buy and it's super cheap. So this is a cattle panel. They sell these at Tractor Supply or any farm supply store, $31. It's 16 feet long. It's made out of very heavy gauge wire. I think it's four gauge. Yeah, we can make three tomato cages out of this. These spaces here are eight inches and the panel is 16 feet long. So you've got 24 of them. Seven of these will make a good size cage. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven right here. You want to preserve that and then you want to cut this one to maximize the use uh, i'm going to cut right down the middle so that i can use that wire to bind it together and my preferred way to cut is a little pair of bolt cutters like this these make quick work of it you know, you can obviously use a hacksaw, you can use a grinder, any number of ways you can cut that. Really should be wearing gloves to do this. Some assembly required, but it's worth it. Now, once you get it to bend all the way, squeeze it tight together, and then just take that half wire and bend it around. Be careful about your fingers, but once you just do a half bend on it, it's strong enough to hold itself. If you're doing a lot of these, you can take a piece of scrap steel 
drill a quarter inch hole in it. The hole needs to be less than eight inches from the end so that you can pivot it around. You can put that quarter inch hole over the wire and then use that to bend it. See, that'll give you a real tight bend there. If you leave these wires full length, it's a lot easier to just do this by hand because the longer wires are easier to bend. Uh, but then you don't get quite as much out of your panel, but it, it still works fine. So now once you've got them all bent up, you can shape the cage a little more. All right, good shape. Now you need it to stick into the ground just cut the bottom and that gives you that much step to push it into the ground. If you want a little more, cut both bottom wires off and you'll have that much. It's been a while since I've made one of these. Don't make that mistake. Don't tie the bottom because you're going to cut that off. There you go. One tomato cage and that will last. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so when you get to your next one, I already have the tie ends over there, so I just want to leave the tie ends long, basically. So this is my seventh section, so that's where I'm going to cut. That's going to leave me eight for the last one. So the last one's going to be a touch bigger. I've been gardening pretty much my whole life, and all the commercial tomato cages that I've tried, one, they're not that cheap. I mean, if you get the ones that are like $4, you may as well not bother because they're just going to fall over. Most of them cost about 10 bucks, and they last for a few years, and they rust out. They're flimsy. If the tomato plant's heavy, they're going to fall over. Basically, they just suck. So I got tired of fooling with them, and I came up with this. Nobody showed this to me, though I'm sure other people have come up with the idea. I'm curious if you've ever seen anyone make tomato cages out of cattle panels before. Comment. It's $31 and half an hour of your time, 10 bucks a piece. I challenge you to find any tomato cage that's anywhere near this good for 10 bucks a piece. And here is a bigger one. This one's about 10 years old. Been used many times, still in great shape. This one used almost half of a panel. It basically has 10 segments in it. If you have a little piece left over, because you made some bigger cages, you can use that little straight piece to make a triangular one like this. Sometimes you just take some tie wire, you can buy separately or from something else, and tie them together like that. And then they're using the ends. Here's a cool tip. Old propane tanks have an old style valve on them. And at least in the United States, they've made it so that it's illegal to refill a tank with this type of valve. So if you wanted to use this tank for propane, you have to take this valve out and put in one of the newer style valves. The problem is buying a new valve will cost just as much as buying a whole new tank with a new valve. So that makes this tank obsolete. What I decided to do is I found a fitting that would go from the propane flare to pipe threads and I just hooked an air quick connect to it. So I've basically converted this into an air tank. Now propane in the sun and hot weather will get up to 200 PSI. So this tank can easily handle the pressure that I'm putting to it. I, I put about 120 PSI air in it. So at my air compressor, I have a hose with a valve on it so that I can hook my and then fill it up. that quick connect is gonna stop the flow of air. Now it's up to you to make sure your tank is structurally sound. Yeah, make sure the tank is not gonna explode before you just do this. But this is super handy to have around the farm. So maybe you're out in the field and you have a flat tire. So there, right at 30 PSI. Enough air in the tank to pump up that entire tire. It was dead flat. Maybe you're working on something that's not near your compressor and you need some air to clean it off. <coughs> Maybe you've got a small woodworking repair to do and you need to run some brad nails. You don't want to run compressor line all the way to the job or maybe your line won't even reach the job. 
I only have about 90 PSI in there now. Let's see how many brads I can drive. These are uh, probably inch and a quarter brads. Oh, that one was shy. It's getting weak, I can feel it. Yeah. So I don't know how many that was, but that's a lot of brads. Now, one thing I will add if you do this, once it's had that propane in it, that propane stink is never gonna go away. So you probably don't want to go inside a house or something and be uh, using this because it's going to smell. Lift with your legs. Don't roll your eyes. This one's important. People always told me when I was growing up, lift with your legs, not with your back. And what that meant to me is don't bend over like this and pick something up, but rather bend at the knees, keep your back straight and pick up like this. And sometimes that's what you have to do. That works fine for lighter objects, but just doing heavy work by myself around the farm, I've learned that you can literally lift with your legs and hardly use your back at all. Like, I mean, what am I gonna do with this? Pick it up like that? Heck no. But I can pick it up and put it on that table saw with minimal use of my back. And it's because I literally lift with my legs. Now, you gotta get into your work to do this. But, so if I wanted to pick this thing up, I wanna get it really close to me. I'm putting it on my thigh and I'm rolling it towards me. So I haven't really done anything with my back, a little bit, but it's all on my leg right now. Now I'm gonna use my leg muscle and get, get it up on my knee. Now I've got it most of the way up there. And if it's tall enough, you can actually just do this. A little bit of back, but I didn't use my back much at all to get it up there. Um, get that back down put it on my knee. I'm being real careful with my back here because this thing is heavy. So on my knee again, now what I can do is pull it real close to me. If, in other words, if this table was too tall and I couldn't do that. And now just stand up. Now, you're gonna use your back a little bit, but nothing like you would if you did it the other way. So stand up, back straight. Now I've got it up and now I can set it on something. I use that all the time for logs and other things as well. It allows you to work all day long picking up heavy things and not injure your back. If your back starts feeling fatigued, you better stop because you don't want that. Yeah, there is, there is no way that I would try to pick this up like this and put it on top of that. I would hurt myself. Here's another common thing I see people doing. Uh, maybe you're trying to get this on a ball or something. Maybe this is all the way up, who knows? people will be trying to move the tongue of a trailer and they'll think they're lifting with their with their legs they'll bend down and they'll they'll do this that's not lifting with your legs if i wanted to lift this up i'd stick my knee under there and i would use nothing but my leg to lift it there's nothing on my back nothing on my arms your legs are really strong and you're not going to injure them like you will your back if you start thinking about this and looking for places where you can literally use your legs you'll find them because I use this all the time. Say you've got some digging to do, you're trying to scrape the grass off of the, the soil or something. Um, I see people all the time, they start digging like this. And that works, but it is all on your back and on your arms. You're not gonna last very long digging like that. If you watch someone who, who holds a shovel for a job, you'll see what they're doing. They're not using their back like that. So put the shovel where you want to dig, hold your hand on it and hit it with your hip. So like, I'm not using my back, I'm not even bent over. And I'm able to just push that shovel right in there. And it's all with my legs. It's not quite the same technique as lifting with your legs, but same idea. If you're doing heavy work, Figure out how you can do it with your legs or your hips. Those are the strongest areas of your body, the least likely to get injured. Don't use your back. So this is one of the best tips that I can that I can share. This is something that we've been doing for years. Permethrin, obviously we buy this stuff by the gallon. We use this as an insecticide and also as a repellent. Uh, we use it on the cattle. Uh, this is considered organic. Permethrin is based on a chemical that is produced in marigolds that a deterrent to insects. This is 36.8% concentrated permethrin. I think they're starting to sell this in 
formulations that are specifically for what I'm about to do. I mix this up to the right concentration. I spray it on my clothes. You only have to do it once a year and it is phenomenal. It's like you're wearing a suit of armor against ticks and chiggers, which are the big things around here. I'm sure it works with other insects too. So I need 16 milliliters of the concentrated solution. And then I've got this little sprayer that is a liter sprayer. So you take that and you dilute it to a liter and then you spray it on your clothes. You can tell I'm not exactly using my Sunday best. I've got a set of clothes that I've labeled for this purpose and I just use the same ones every year. Just spray until they're damp, flip them over, spray the other side, and then let them dry. So you let those dry out completely, and then you can wear them like that, or you can run them through the washer if you want to reduce your exposure. Permethrin, though, is a medicine that's actually used in people. I think they use it for lice and stuff like that. It's a very benign compound to us. So oftentimes I'll let them dry, and then I'll just go ahead and wear them. But then you, when you're done, you know, and they get dirty, you can wash them. And these will last me the entire season. I'll wear these and they will still be effective in the fall. And then, you know, once winter hits, I don't wear them anymore because you don't need to. And uh, then next spring, I'll do it again. And uh, man, this for me, because there's a lot of ticks and chiggers around here, which are just miserable. And this is like a suit of armor that is not annoying at all. You just put them on and you're good. So these earmuffs have been sitting outside on my tractor. Always check inside, make sure there's no spiders or critters or anything in there before you put them on. Because getting stung on the ear by a black widow, not cool. So I left these hanging on my sawmill. It was probably a couple weeks. I was trying to work fast. I almost grabbed them and threw them right on my head. But I grabbed them and I looked and then I threw them down and ran away because what I saw was that covered with wasps. Yeah, then I went and got some wasp spray and sprayed them out. That would have been a bad day. Starting bonfires. Now, obviously, when you want to burn something big, you want it to be wet. You don't want to risk the fire spreading somewhere. In the middle of a dry spell out in a field, that fire will really spread across that dry grass. So you have to be careful about that. So you burn when it's wet. Well, the problem is when it's wet, it can be hard to get fires to start. And what many people do and what I used to do is use fuel like diesel fuel and gasoline to get the fire going. Let me tell you a quick story. I had a fire much bigger than this, big material, like up to eight inches. It was something that I could like crawl up on top of, big fire. And I was trying to get it going. I didn't want to just use gasoline. Frequently gasoline, it's dangerous. It will flare up. If the wood's wet at all, the gasoline is gonna burn away before it starts. And then you haven't done anything. So, you know, you soak things down with diesel fuel, which is not explosive like gasoline. And then you'll use like a burning rag or something to get the diesel fuel going. So I did that, it didn't work, it went out. I tried that several times and then I took some gasoline and I kinda made an area of gasoline beside the diesel. And I got, you know, I throw a, a rag on that, it flares up, it still went out. I tried that several times. I was getting frustrated because I wanted to get this thing burned. So um, now this was, this was a bad idea. I ended up getting up on the pile, trying to get the gas in a good area, the gas and diesel in a good area where there was lots of kindling to get it started. I'm standing up on this pile, picture this. This pile's probably 15, 20 feet long and 10 feet wide. I'm pretty much right in the middle of it, pouring diesel fuel and getting ready to pour some gasoline onto an area of kindling. Now I had let this thing sit for a good while, getting ready to pour the gasoline and I heard a noise and I didn't know what it was. And uh, it was an odd noise. It was just kind of something coming under the pile. And I thought that does not sound right. So I jumped down off the pile and literally down on the ground off the pile, I turn around, it flares up right where I just was. So one of my previous starting attempts had left an ember somewhere and it finally caught and the whole pile went up. So be careful using fuel. The point of all this, there's a much safer, easier, more reliable way to do it. 
that's what I'm going to show you. This is just a 20 pound propane bottle like you use on a grill. And this is one of those cheapo weed torches. I pretty much always have a weed torch on one of these bottles. I use it for various things. I, also, I do torch weeds with it sometimes, but mostly it's to start fires like this. So this will put a lot of heat right where you want it, but there's no chance of a flare up. It's very predictable. Obviously, once the fire gets going, get the propane tank away from it. But this is the safe way to start pretty much any bonfire, even if it's really wet. Like, this is pretty wet right now. that'll do it the nice thing is is if you try to light it and it ends up going out you can restart your propane torch you can come over do it again there's no chance because you haven't dumped any fuel on it there's no chance of it flaring up in your face and doing something unpredictable it was probably 15 years ago when I had that close call with that bonfire and I have never used fuel on a bonfire since Handle's really not bad. <clears throat> All right, I ate a screwdriver. Come on now, you can hit that like button. That's the least you can do. So there you go, guys. Eight real practical farm and garden hacks. I'm curious, has anyone seen all these before? I would be surprised, but certainly a possibility. Which one was your favorite? Comment below, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks for watching.